Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these Brown Bag Lectures. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Our speaker today is Professor Dale Gibbs. Um, professor, or professor Dale Gibbs was, um, worked at the College of Architecture as a professor for many years at UNL. He is a registered architect and also a fellow with the American Institute of Architects. His talk today is titled An Architectural Album of Lincoln Houses. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dale Gibbs. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, don't be amazed by all these notes. It's just that I need large print now, so it <laughs> takes more space. Uh, I want to uh, thank Eileen for inviting me and to congratulate the association for all the good work they uh, do in Lincoln. Also, uh, I have to thank people who helped put this together, including the staff at the Architecture Library, Kay and Judy, who furnished images, and uh, also Dave Murphy at the Historical Society, and Ed Zimmer, who filled out some uh, gaps in my knowledge of these houses. <laughs> so I appreciate that. But I want to especially thank Doug Beals, who's the computer genius who put this together. To so show you how far behind I am, uh, it amazed me that they can take a book at the library and do something to it, and it ends up on his computer in South Lincoln. I, that just amazed me. Uh, when Eileen asked me to talk about, uh, to the group, uh, we discussed several topics, and none of them seemed compelling to me, so I suggested to her that, thinking about it, it occurred to me that it's almost 40 years ago that the Junior League of Lincoln, at the urging of Norman Geske, decided to record the architecture of Lincoln. And their first efforts were a series of audiovisual presentations uh, showing all the important buildings that they'd put together. And that was very successful. And then they said, well, you know, we should have a permanent record of this. So they decided to do uh, the, this book called An Architectural Album. Uh, and uh, Linda Jones was the chairman of the publication <laughs> committee. But they did this series of audiovisual presentations, and then they had to assemble uh, several committees and three years in preparation to put this little book out. Uh, there, besides Linda, there were dozens of <coughs> Junior League volunteers, and I'm glad to see some of them here uh, today. Uh, we all know that this was a lot of work, a lot of persistence, and uh, it really paid off. I think uh, they also asked for professional advice from architects and other advisors, including Norman, who stayed with the project all the way through, and Bill Schlebitz and Steve Flanders, architects, and Dave Murphy, who's here today, and Keith Sawyer is my colleague at the university. And there are a lot of other people I noticed that Linda recognizes in the introduction who gave technical advice, publication advice, and so forth. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad some of those people are here today. The book is out of print, of course, uh, but I'm told that you can f people have found it on ePay and even in used bookstores. Uh, and it's an important contribution to the uh, preservation idea in, in Lincoln. So uh, I think that's what uh, makes it have such staying power. And it's really, if we don't have the efforts of individuals and organizations like that, and like your organization, uh, we lose our architectural heritage. And I just want to point out one example uh, of this. Uh, as I look at the audience, many of you are too young to remember this, but many years ago at about 22nd O Street, there was a, what was the formal entrance to Antelope Park. It was a, seri it was a, a series of enormous columns, about 35, 40 feet tall which had been brought to Lincoln from a federal building in Washington. And they were connected by a wrought iron fence. Uh, and it, was in t it stood there for many years. Sometime in the 1960s, the city, uh, I suppose in a budget crunch, decided to sell the property 
to, the, to a Safeway store. And the columns were taken down and moved unceremoniously to Pioneer Park, where they now lay uh, like Roman ruins. Uh, as I think about this, I think, well, now that they've developed this Antelope Valley thing with all that nice trails and everything, what a nice symbol that would have been for the Antelope Valley uh, <laughs> proposal. And uh, so we have to be careful. There, we have lost a lot of important buildings, and we can't save everything. There are some buildings that are so far deteriorated that you just can't do them, either that or there's no uh, logical use for them. Uh, but uh, we have saved uh, uh, quite a few of them. As I look at this little book, it's a uh, really a rich collection of houses and churches and public buildings. And, uh, and trying to assemble this talk, I thought, I can't talk about all of that. I've got to just talk about some of it. Uh, usually, if you give a professor a topic, he'll make a semester course out of it. <laughs> but that wasn't always the case with me. I remember when I was first asked to teach, uh, I was talking to the dean and I <coughs> said, you know, uh, I'm a little nervous about giving two or three 50-minute lectures a week. And, uh, and Linus Burst smith the dean, looked at me and he said, uh, young man, uh, first thing a requirement for a professor is to keep on talking long after you have anything to say. <laughs> so that hasn't been my problem since that, uh, that day. Uh, and uh, so I decided for this talk to focus just on houses, uh, because Lincoln has an extraordinary collection of houses as you drive around the city. And as I was driving around looking at some of my favorites, I thought, you know, this is really extraordinary, the variety, and the quality of the houses, uh, that's worth uh, talking about. And it makes up the fabric of our, of our neighborhoods, which is another important aspect of Lincoln. Now, these are not famous houses. Uh, they are not going to appear in all the textbooks on houses. But collectively, they show our taste and our choices over more than a century. And they have very interesting uh, backgrounds. I would like to start, however, with four buildings in the book which are in fact famous and uh, are in Lincoln. And Doug, if we could show us, there we are with the state capitol, you all know. Now this building is internationally famous. If you find architects from Europe, Asia, come to the United States, if they're touring to see buildings, they uh, usually they want to see New York, Frank Lloyd Wright, very often they stop to see this building because it is uh, a landmark building in the history of architecture. And then the next one is uh, First Plymouth Church by Van Buren McGonigal, an equally famous building. We could spend uh, a semester talking about the refinement and the artistry of this building. The next one is NBC Wells Fargo, which is by the IM Pay firm in New York, but actually designed by Jim Freed of that office. And the last one is Sheldon Gallery. I'd like to pause just a little bit about uh, Sheldon, uh, because this may not be uh, Philip Johnson's best building. I'm not sure about that, but I think it in many ways was his favorite building, and I would just like to tell you a little bit about that. Philip was one of my professors in graduate school, and at the time, uh, he was not uh, a registered architect in either New York or Connecticut. And uh, the legend that uh, he told about this was that the reason was that he couldn't pass the design part of it. <laughs> well, he was already a famous designer. He had designed his own glass house in, in New Canaan. And, and he had before that been the curator of architecture at the Museum of Modern Art. So he was a well-known name. But as the truth uh, turned out later on, uh, it was the structural and mechanical part of the exam that he couldn't pass. And uh, I'm in complete sympathy <laughs> with him on, on that score. <laughs> I, I did stay in touch with Philip uh, uh, after he did the Sheldon Gallery. And I remember visiting one, him once in New York in the Seagram's building, which he had done with Mies van der Rohe. This would have been in the late 60s or early 70s, and having a chat with him. And uh, 
he was sort of waxing nostalgic about the uh, Sheldon Gallery. Uh, I think because it was really the first major building which he was solely responsible for. He had done these houses. He was a consulting architect on Lincoln Center, from which this artistic idiom comes, by the way, because we call it his Lincoln Center period. It's a kind of a neoclassic uh, period. But I think the greatest uh, comment on his affection for the building was that at his uh, glass house in Connecticut, there is a road high above the house, and it drops about 50 feet to a plateau where the glass house sits, and maybe you've all seen this. And then it drops another probably 100, 150 feet to a lake. And in the lake, there is a little pavilion. And the pavilion is a miniature reproduction of the Sheldon Gallery. So for the rest of his life in that house, what he was looking at is not the Pennzoil building or the Pittsburgh building or any of those, but this little reproduction of the Sheldon. And it is a, a fine building indeed. If it combines a wonderful setting for the art with a great sense of spatial quality. And if you want to see a building where you have beautiful materials, beautifully detailed and executed, then you should go, you have to go and look at that building very closely. Uh, I want to show you four different categories of houses. This is the body of, of the talk. And uh, these houses are so common that we really forget about their influence on our, on our daily lives. Because as you, you drive, we all drive by them every day, sometimes <coughs> too fast to notice them. I'm only going to go into detail about two houses, however, which have an interesting and sort of mysterious history. Uh, but here, the categories of the house are the American Prairie House, the California House, which includes bungalows and Spanish-style houses, the Beaux-Arts period, which is the historical period of the 1920s and 30s, and then the modern house. And, and, and Doug, if we can uh, start with uh, the first slide. Uh, this is a personal choice about what to show. And if I don't show your favorite house, uh, forgive me. I, mem I remember uh, several years ago giving a talk like this, and uh, after the talk, the lady came up to me, uh, for, reminded me of my sc uh, school teacher in the fourth grade, and she said to me, uh, Mr. Gibbs, I notice you call that house the Peterson House, but I've lived there for 35 years. When does it get to my house? <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, right now. <laughs> and, so I've learned to try. So if I don't use the proper name, you'll ex excuse me. Uh, I'd like to talk about the American uh, Prairie House a little bit. If you lived in the, uh, this country before the Civil War, where most of the population was on the East Coast, you probably lived in a row house. If you were affluent, you owned the row house, which was a three or four story house. There were probably 10 or 12 of those in a row. Now this made perfectly good sense as a residential type because if you had every room heated by a fireplace, you didn't want a lot of exposure. So those row houses just had a little bit of glass on the facade and perhaps some more on the garden side. But after the Civil War, as the country began to expand, uh, the whole business of how to live changed. And first of all, uh, you moved, people began to move into the suburbs. The land was a little bit cheaper. That was one thing. They also began to move out into the Midwest to, in some cases, isolated farmhouses or, or fledgling towns like Lincoln, uh, other Midwestern towns where you could afford to have a freestanding house on your own lot. The other thing, uh, after the Civil War, a little book appeared. Uh, and I think I have the author right, Andrew Jackson Downing, uh, who published a little book which uh, dealt with the idea that you could have a house that you could take care of without servants. Uh, and as we began to move to the Midwest, People dropped the idea of, of having a servant, primarily. And so you got uh, this very compact house 
which was easy to maintain. And the, his whole message was, you can have a reasonably good sized house without having two or three servants. And that made a great influence on people's choices of houses. Now these houses also fitted the sort of Midwestern psyche. They were very pragmatic, straightforward, sensible houses. Uh, they were almost always square, so you get sort of the maximum volume for the minimum amount of footings. And they had very, uh, they were very adaptable. Uh, the, unlike the Georgian house or uh, other similar period houses, the stairways were almost always into the corner of the house. Now this allowed the traffic to be in that instead of in the middle of the house. Now the unfortunate part about this was that uh, later on, uh, many of these houses in the nearest, for instance, in the near south neighborhood, they were very easy uh, uh, because of that placement of the stairway to convert into apartments. So many of these houses which uh, we see uh, are now uh, converted. Uh, so uh, I want to show you a few uh, of my own choice in this highly personal, but you can see they were sort of what I call a four square house with a front porch. Very sensible, straightforward, usable. Typical Midwestern conservatism. Okay? They, these come in various, uh, various styles and treatments. This is on South 28th Street in Lincoln. All right? This is, shows you the variety of them. Some of them are in, in brick. Uh, they're, some of them are all frame. And uh, they're very solid, very usable houses. You get variations of this, like this sort of Dutch gambrel roof with that <coughs> elaborate balcony, which shows a sort of a little bit more playful nature. Okay? And this house, which is at 33rd and Randolph, I just pause on this a little bit <coughs> because this is the Snell house, and Mr. Snell was the founder of Midwest Life Insurance Company. And for its day, this was a rather elaborate house. But I just want to point uh, a couple of stylistic things here which uh, show a little advancement. This is more Frank Lloyd Wright, and part of that is this port, porch covering which comes out, which ties the bulky square house down to the ground a little bit more, which was one of Wright's features. The other thing is the long porch that goes along to the right-hand side with its limestone cap. And if you'll notice on the far right side, the projection of that brick bay that comes out. Those were typical kind of right features to try to soften that severity uh, of, of the typical uh, sort of prairie house, all right? <clears throat> Some of these are rather fanciful, have, been, have more elaborate word work, but they're basically still. The, and this is, in fact, a genuine prairie house. Most of you may know this, it's uh, uh, on Ryan Street. This, in the, uh, early in his career, Wright uh, sold house plans through the Ladies' Home Journal. So you could order this plan. <coughs> I call this the Perry House because they, that family lived there for so many years. And uh, he sold these ar all around the country. It was also true of the early Perry House, which I showed you, is that many of those houses in the Midwest were ordered from Sears Roebuck's catalogs. They would arrive on the a uh, railroad car in your community, and the local carpenter would put them up. So this is a very sort of a hands-on kind of thing. This house is still uh, rather nicely intact, but I'd like to point out one thing, is that uh, the current owners have painted it a kind of monochromatic clay color. Uh, that uh, really erases its design features, because one of the characteristic features are the way the windows are grouped right up at the top and very tight to the overhang. That gave you a kind of freeze of windows which moved around the house. And when you, when you don't emphasize that woodwork and take it into a monochromatic tone, you lose the character of the house a little bit. But uh, we're still lucky to have this. At least we have one Frank Lloyd Wright house. Next, I'd like to show you what I call the California house. And this includes the California bungalow and uh, what, what I call the Spanish cottage. And this was a very popular 
style. We can show the first slide here. Uh, during the 20s and 30s, and the question is, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, this is out of, this is out of, we've got the English country house here. Is that in the right order? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, we'll show the English country house, which uh, was a style in the 20s. And you see it in various sizes and models. This is a, uh, the, what I call the Archie Fur House on South 24th Street, which is a rather grand English manor. It's characterized by very fine brickwork, uh, very prominent chimneys, uh, the sort of almost Tudor windows, which you see uh, above the uh, entrance there, okay? And then uh, it comes in variations where they emphasize more the half timber aspect of this. This is on Man, or this is on Woods Crest, okay. And this is on Mance Avenue, uh, and uh, it's a typical, almost completely half timber English house. And they came in small versions. There, are, there, are, I found at least a half a dozen very small little cottages. There are a couple over by the country club and they're scattered all over town. They're very nicely proportioned and they have that very small half timber, as you can see, with those very delicate little dormers coming out at the top. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, what I call the Cotswold Farmhouse. Uh, these are houses of limestone uh, set rather roughly, usually with uh, uh, slate roofs. This is in uh, East Pershing Road uh, as one of my favorite little houses, tucked back. What I found, however, about a lot of these houses is, you know, when you first buy a house, you, st you think it looks so bare around it, <laughs> and people start planning things. And before you know it, the house is completely obscured by the landscape. And I found that this was the case in many of the houses we were trying to photograph. But this is a charming house of the 1920s. Okay, and this is a larger version of it on Van Dorn Street. <coughs> it's characterized by those gables. And this is, uh, as I looked at this, I thought, that's almost an exact copy of a Cotswold barn. And, the, and the, the reason for that is the way this flat gable comes out from the main roof line. And it's done in the same kind of rough limestone. Now, this is not new. This has been put up in the last three or four years. Not a house, it's an art gallery out in the Campbell's uh, development. But it shows you how styles keep resurfacing and how, uh, still in a, how a new rendition of an old style can be charming, okay? <coughs> and then the Beaux-Arts style. Now this uh, comes from the uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, which was the great training ground for architects in the 19th century. Uh, if you think about it, it uh, there were very few training opportunities for architects. In fact, the first architecture school in America was 1892 at MIT. All the major architects of the 19th century were trained in Paris, McKim, Meaden, White, Richard Morris Hunt, all of H. H. Richardson, all of those who appear in the history books are uh, trained in Paris. Uh, and how were they trained? Well, they were trained to go around and look at historical models of, of buildings, whether it was a Gothic cathedral, a French chateau, whatever it was. In the 19th century, it never occurred to them that there could be a style which was not dependent upon history. That didn't happen until the very end of the 19th century when we start to get a few architects revolting against this sort of bureaucratic historical emphasis and saying, well, you know, maybe there could be a style for our own time that utilizes our own set of ideas. But most of the time, uh, the architects were trained in this historical uh, tradition. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in Lincoln, uh, the university did not have an architecture program until 1933, when Harry Cunningham, who was a supervising architect for the Capitol Building and a very talented architect, was hired by the university, first started a department. It became a degree program in 1935. 
But prior to that, all the architects working in Lincoln would have been trained one of two ways. Either they would apprenticed themselves to an architect, uh, or they would have gone to an architecture school somewhere else. And an awful lot of them uh, who came to Lincoln, say, in the 1920s, that were trained at the University of Illinois. Uh, they uh, included, in the very beginning, people like Ferdinand Fisk, who was a prominent architect, and Jesse Miller, Buzz Schomburg, for whom I worked, and Harry McGinnis, Bruce Haven, Marvin Robinson, Fritz Craig. All of those people were trained somewhere else, and they were trained in this Beaux-Arts tradition. Now, they were very good architects at doing these historical styles. As a matter of fact, when I was still a student at the university, I remember Jesse Miller working in our office at Schomburg and Freeman. And uh, uh, he seemed like an old person to me at that time, but I, don't, I think he was only probably in his early 70s or so at that. <laughs> and he, uh, uh, we, uh, the office was asked, of course, by that time to do remodeling work on some of these houses which were built in the 20s, and particularly on fraternity houses at the university. Well, none of us of my age knew how to do any of the details that were associated with those buildings. So McGinnis and Schomburg had to reach back and get Jesse to do uh, this work because we were hopeless, uh, because we had been coached that, oh, you know, that historical stuff. You know, you want to have really clean details and modern stuff. You don't want to do any of that. But we had, starting in the 1920s, a series of very good architects. And they are responsible for most of those neighborhoods that you see, like Sheridan Boulevard, Woodscrest, Woodshear. All of those things were most of those buildings were done by these architects. And uh, you have to admire, admire their uh, expertise at, at putting those uh, together. And I want to show you a few of those, of those houses. Uh, and I'm starting with a house which you might not think of as uh, a Beaux-Arts, but this is the Atwood House, which is classical revival. Now this starts, uh, this house is from 1893, okay? And Whitehall, one of my favorites, uh, a classic house which people don't see because it's over on Layton Avenue, uh, and I don't know how many of you have driven by it, but it's a charming house. I'd just like to point out that one of the things that makes it so nice is that not only the refinement of the detail, but it has this beautiful salmon brick, and you can play the white against that. It's a very soft effect, and while it's formal, it has a wonderfully kind of warm uh, enchantment about it, all right? And the, uh, the Campbell House on Woodscrest, which is a sort of a mini French chateau, uh, very beautifully done. Uh, the way, uh, notice how, how the windows cut through the eave line. That's very typical of that style. And then the two wings, uh, two rooms on either side, okay? And a Tuscan villa, this is the uh, uh, house on, on Woods Crest. Uh, uh, it has a long history. When I was in grade school, one of my classmates lived there. And as I drive by that house, I often think of the, the uh, sort of family history of houses, which is intriguing. And uh, the Caldwell family was there. And I often think, I wonder whatever happened to Sally Caldwell. There that house is, and then it became the Woods House. And then the, uh, <coughs> Miss uh, Louise Granger lived there, and Bob Ferguson, and then I don't know who lived there after that. But it's, it is a Tuscan villa style, all right? And then the, uh, I call this the Dr. Everett House. The, the Whiteheads now own it. And it is a, an Italianate villa with a very formal aspect to it, formal gardens originally in back and a very formal approach to it in front. Notice uh, how, how the windows are, are very nicely cut into the building with the little balconies softening uh, above. The, uh, this is a very handsome house. Uh, one of the things that surprised me in, in going through two or three of these in recent years, however, and I'm sure that you've noticed this, 
is that how people could live in much smaller uh, spaces. This looks like an enormous house, but the truth is the rooms are not enormous inside. Uh, so it gives it a, a little cozier uh, charm. And most of these, including the English houses I showed you, have <coughs> very few closets, very small kitchens, and it amazes you to think that people could live that way. They had uh, maybe a one-stall garage in, a, in an age when now people have four cars, so it seems really ama amazing, okay? And this is a sort of a Spanish-style uh, house uh, on uh, Lafayette Avenue, very nicely done with its little uh, uh, balcony uh, protruding from the top there, done in a very warm brick color, which makes it charming, all right? And uh, the Colonial House, the Aiken House on Woodsdale, very nicely proportioned. What makes uh, many of these houses very nice is w the way they sit on their lots. And of course, these were very affluent people. They could afford these big lots. And also, they had the advantage of, of good landscaping on them. This house is standing up very well. I'm not crazy about the <coughs> brick wall, which or the brick posts which are in front, which are not original to the house. I think they could have been done a little bit more sensitively than that, okay? Now I want to go back to, to the Atwood house just a moment because there's a kind of a mystery surrounding this house. Uh, and <laughs> I'm indebted to Ann Seidels who did some research on this house. The, uh, the little book says that this was built by the Atwoods in in 1900, <clears throat> and uh, that uh, proves not to be quite be the case. The records show that a Frank Little and his wife Mary uh, bought this lot in 1892, and they took out mortgages uh, in 93, 94, 95, ostensibly to build this house. Now, why are we looking at this uh, closely? because this house has a direct connection to Frank Lloyd Wright. That is our supposition. And the, the city has fairly good records, but they're a little hazy. And this is something that needs to be researched by somebody. Frank Little, who was really Francis Little from Peoria, Illinois, was a utilities executive in Sioux City. He came to Lincoln and he was president of the Lincoln uh, Street Railway Company. You all remember when, or, well maybe not, when the, <laughs> when, when, the, when the railway ran down the middle of Sheridan Boulevard, clear out to College View, and then it went through Antelope Park and down South Street to 56th Street. Well, he was president of that company along with some other prominent uh, uh, Lincoln people. And uh, they lived there evidently from 1892 until uh, 95 or 96. We know, and this, I'm indebted to Anne for this, that they lost a child wh who was buried in Wayuka Cemetery. And shortly after, they evidently moved back to Peoria, Illinois. Now, uh, we know, because Buddy Seidel's checked this, that the transfer of deed to this house was done in Peoria, Illinois. And when they got to Peoria, Illinois in 1902, they built a rather elaborate house by Frank Lloyd Wright. And the records show that they lost that house for financial reasons after two or three years, which seems kind of amazing because he seems to have been a successful businessman. <coughs> they later moved to Minneapolis, where Frank Lloyd Wright built one of the landmark prairie houses. The little house in Wazada is one of a, a half a dozen which really made Wright's career. And they lived there for many years uh, and it was uh, finally uh, Mrs. Little uh, gave the house to her daughter. And the daughter lived there, Eleanor Stevenson was her name, and she lived there for a long time and finally the Stevensons couldn't maintain the house and unfortunately the house was torn down uh, sometime in the, in the mid-50s. But uh, it had an e elaborate music room because Mrs. Little was a concert pianist. And the music room is now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And the other rooms, and this is where preservation comes in, 
The other rooms were rescued too, and, and all of the stained glass and a lot of the details, and they were distributed to various historical societies or museums that wanted them around the United States. But the intriguing thing about this is whether or not Frank Lloyd Wright had a hand in this house in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is what we're trying to figure out. Well, it, you might think it does not look like Frank Lloyd Wright at all, does it? No, except that it has a very low pitch roof and a very wide overhang. And let's see the next slide, however. Well, uh, it does look like Frank Lloyd Wright because this is a genuine Frank Lloyd Wright house built in the same year as this little house in Lincoln, Nebraska, 1893. And there are two things about it which are similar. Uh, can we go back? Yes. Uh, uh, notice the Palladian windows in this house. The, that is the center window, the two side windows, and the little arch over the top. Then can we go back to the Atwood house? There you see the same windows repeated on this house, or at the entranceway and <coughs> over the top. Now, we can't fit together all the pieces of this puzzle, but it is a possibility that the Atwoods might have had right moonlight this house. At the time, he was, of course, he was always in need of money. He was working for Louis Sullivan, the famous architect, but at night he was doing these bootleg houses. And uh, although he was a purist in many ways, he needed the money so badly that if he wanted a classical house, he would do a classical house. So uh, that makes this house, uh, among our group of historical houses, very interesting. Here's Wright with uh, a, a very nice slide of, of the Blossom House. Okay, the the next category is the is modern architecture. California bungalow. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, California bungalow. Now, why would we be interested in this? Well, we've got a lot of them in Lincoln, and uh, the question is, well, why do you have these California houses in Lincoln, Nebraska? Uh, well, there are several reasons. For one thing, after World War One. <laughs> people began traveling to California and they would see these houses. That was one thing. The second thing was that magazines like the Ladies Home Journal, Better Homes and Gardens, things like that, that formerly would just publish household hints and recipes and things like that, began to publish house plans and photographs of houses and interiors. And the third thing, which was probably more important than anything else, was uh, the movies because in the, uh, the teens and in the early 20s, before studios had huge back lots where they could build sets and everything, they shot the movies just around Los Angeles. And Los Angeles was full of these bungalows and Spanish-style houses. So all of a sudden in the 20s and into the 30s even, these houses became very uh, popular. And uh, the, we see them along uh, streets. What, what is one of the characteristics of this, and this occurs only, as far as I can tell, in American houses. I've had European visitors come and look at these houses and say, isn't that strange? You have a brick column coming up above the, the uh, porch railing, and then you have a, what we call a truncated column holding up the, that uh, eave. Uh, you never see this anyplace else, this stylistic, little piece of design. And they're all over the city of Lincoln. Uh, okay. Some of them are more elaborate. This is on South 24th Street, a very a larger one. Okay. And this is one of my favorites. It's on South 19th Street. And I want you to look very closely. Uh, for one thing, it is, it is not a huge house, but the brickwork is beautifully articulated. Uh, it could be a kind of a stolid, lumpy kind of a house, but it is not. Uh, one thing that makes it uh, more interesting is the way all of the structural elements are exposed. Notice all the little rafters peeking out along the eave. That gives it a kind of fine texture. The windows are also attractive. But the main thing is the way the uh, ridge line curves up almost like an oriental pavilion. And this happens at all of the ridge lines around the house, and it has a beautiful portcochere off to one side. So it is the typical kind of uh, 
bungalow with this nice little porch and the, and the cashier, okay? And this uh, over by First Plymouth Church is a rather typical bungalow, multiple uh, sort of gables like this. Unfortunately, this is not in the best repair, but it's still okay. And it has a wonderful kind of active texture to it, which makes it fascinating, okay? And then I'd like to show you how this reoccurs. This is a remodeling of an existing house. It can't be more than five years old uh, on Calvert Street. And it has, what do we have here? The same characteristics. This is a house remodeled sort of in the arts and crafts tradition, very effectively done. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a really good shot of it from the front, but it has a wonderful kind of fence right on the street side in the same artistic uh, vein, uh, which <coughs> sort of shelters it from the street. But it shows you how this idiom keeps reappearing. This is now 50, 60, 70 years ago, and it's still on the scene, all right? Or these house, uh, townhouses in South Lincoln. Uh, this is revived, and one of the great uh, uh, impetus to this was a young a couple in Florida, Plater Zyberg was the firm, who sort of uh, came up with the idea that, you know, the front porch is not all bad. If you want a neighborhood and people talking to each other, maybe we should get into the more of this village mode. Well, this, these uh, are townhouses, but they can't be more than uh, five years old or so, okay? And then the Spanish house. Uh, I've always in, been intrigued by why people in Lincoln would pick this, but you can see their, uh, <laughs> their taste was influenced by magazines and movies and so forth. These houses tend to be very small. They're plaster houses, but they're, I suspect, may have been done by the, either the same architects or the same builders because the detailing is very uniform on them and it's very accurate. Notice the rather elaborate decoration around the front door and then this little window. They're charming, uh, small houses, okay? Here's another one on uh, Woodsdale. This is a, a one on Ryan, so barely able to see it, but notice the wonderful kind of Baroque Spanish window into the living room. And a little larger, this is, I was glad to see the owners have uh, followed the stylistic chain. Those tall uh, Roman pines are perfect landscape for that house. Okay. And this house, which is out in uh, uh, Campbell's development, uh, the village out there, uh, can't be more than two or three years old. It shows how enduring this uh, stylistic trend really is. Okay. And then the modern house. Now, uh, let's think a little bit about why, why we call this modern architecture. Well, it begins in Europe in the late 1890s when there was a revolt against the sort of elitist atmosphere of architecture schools and universities. And it develops in the late uh, 1890s into the early 1900s. But it particularly gets a terrific push after World War I. And part of that is uh, based on two things. One of it was a reaction to the kind of bureaucratic, elitist thing that got Europe into World War I, and also a, a reaction to the historicism of uh, education up to that point. So you get uh, the foundation of schools like the Bauhaus by Walter Gropius, which is really in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, this came to the United States primarily when Gropius was hired by Harvard University in about 1935, after he fled Europe. And uh, it doesn't come to Lincoln until about 1950 when Kenneth Clark and Larry Anderson, who were both students of Gropius at Harvard, came to Lincoln to found the firm of Clark and Anderson. But there had been modern influences. I mean, architects in Lincoln were not totally uh, blanked out on this. 
They got the magazines. They knew what was going on in Europe. They knew that there was a modern movement going. The question is, could you do a modern building in Lincoln? Well, let's start with these. These are a little apartments on South 17th Street, and this is a style which we call Art Modern. Now this, although Gropius founded the modern movement in the early 20s, this style comes from the Great Paris Exposition of 1925, which was introduced the term Art Modern. Now what is it? <coughs> why, why would we think of this? Well, first of all, is the, way, uh, the corner windows and the way the windows are cleanly cut into the facade. The other thing is that this is as close as these people could come to the white stucco buildings which were all over Europe by this time. Uh, and the, their choice was to use limestone for one reason is that stucco does not weather very well in Lincoln, Nebraska, where you go from 110 to minus 20. Uh, it does, so they used a stone for these buildings and they're still quite handsome, but they date from the 1930s. Okay, and then Phi Delta Theta Fraternity House, which is a distinctly uh, art modern building with its, and what, it, what are the keys to this? Well, one is the glass brick, which was a favorite thing. The other is using limestone uh, to get this smooth surface. Now, uh, you know, we criticize a lot of things, but I want to congratulate whoever did this fence in front of the building here because it's a beautiful art, really more art deco fence. And uh, I know that we didn't see it in the slide, but it shows you the sensitivity of the designer. If you look up on the building at the corner of the building, there are what we call coins. They're offsets of the stonework going up both sides of the glass brick. And when they <coughs> did the fence, they repeated this motif on the wall at the corner. Now that takes a kind of a sensitive designer to <coughs> do that, and the fence is absolutely beautiful. So there are some times when people really pay attention to architectural preservation, okay? And this is the Soshnik House on Memorial Drive. Uh, I think I'm right, this is by uh, Clark and Anderson. Joe Soshnik, as you remember, was the chancellor of the university. And this is a very handsome house. Uh, I've known uh, several people who lived in it. And uh, at its best, the, the modern house had a kind of flexibility and a kind of openness and a kind of calmness, which was very good. Its lack of lots of detail was kind of refreshing. It was the perfect foil for 1950s sort of sculptural furniture, like the Eames chair or the Saarinen chair or the Mies van der Rohe chairs. That was a wonderful sort of contrast in there. At the worst, it followed some of the modernist dictums, and that was they emphasized economy and efficiency. And so you get many of these contemporary 1950s houses, which are made up of rooms which are too tight. As a matter of fact, Gropius, although he was celebrated, and rightly so, as the father of modern architecture, his student housing at the Harvard Graduate School is the most cruel building I've ever been in. <laughs> and it shows you that uh, at some point, and this happened in America in the late 60s, early 70s, people begin to say, uh, well, let's see this mantra of modern architecture. I wonder <coughs> if that's completely right. So we begin to question that, and you begin then to get more interest in, in historicism and texture and variations of the modern theme. Uh, and uh, <coughs> let's show the rest of the, this. This is what has happened to the Sashnik house. Uh, it had a flat roof. Well, a flat roof is not, it's okay in Lincoln, Nebraska, if you do it really well, it will last a long time. Uh, but these, uh, the owners have taken the flat roof up and evidently put a pitched roof and then they added this parapet above the line there you two see which totally destroys the proportion of the house and it's the danger of doing something on the cheap you know why not take the house where it should be in its original form it's a danger cheap stuff it reminds me of the story of Warren Buffett being interviewed by the New York Times and they, uh, this reporter said, well, Mr. Buffett, I understand 
you drive an old car and you wear cheap suits. He said, well, my car is a little bit old. Uh, but he said, actually, those are expensive suits. They just look cheap on me. <laughs> and so you have to be careful what you, what you do to a, to a house like this because it spoils the integrity of the house, okay? And this is the Cipriano house on, uh, uh, in South Lincoln. Uh, it shows both the merits and the disadvantages of, of, of that style. Uh, it provided very workable interiors very often, but s sometimes the uh, severity of the architecture was oppressive. And I remember a story about uh, one modern architect, Serge Shermayev, who was a very good architect. He designed a, uh, because the owners said they wanted it, a modern house, which was extremely severe. And uh, after the owners moved in, it appeared in all the magazines, of course it was very fashionable. And after the owners lived in a little while, suddenly the, I saw another picture in the uh, a magazine of this, and the owner had gone out in this living room, uh, which was very severe, and she bought two brightly colored oriental rugs. And she put those down in the living room, and I want to tell you, it brought that modern house to life. It shows you uh, one of the gestures that you, a period furniture or a beautiful object is, is okay in a, in a contemporary house. And some of the best have done that. Okay? And this is Jim Stang's house on Calvert Street, which is still handsome, I think. This is Dion Barr's house, which is really more of a postmodern house. Instead of dealing with that rigid geometry, he's dealing with trapezoids and triangles, which softens the image a great deal. Okay? And this is a house which, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this. It is tucked off of O Street, uh, just before 84th Street. And I stumbled on it one day, uh, trying to get there. I tried to contact the owner, I could not, in the house, and I, but I suspect it's right on the bicycle trail, and I suspect that it is a remodel of an existing building. But I point it out to you, because you might not think of it as completely modern, but it is really more Art Deco. The very interesting thing is that the two posts at the driveway go up to glass brick, which are lighted, so you get lights right at the entranceway, and then the very severe way the windows are set in, softened somewhat by the, and then the actually great contrast with these Roman pines which go up. It's a very handsome house indeed, and I don't know who did it, okay? And then uh, this is Al Quick's house for uh, Dr. Chesson, which is in the uh, mode of the French architect Corbusier, uh, whose style was white plaster, lots of exposed steel. It was made popular in the United States by the, the American architect Richard Meyer, who designed the great Getty Museum out in California. And this is a very uh, handsome house. The, the uh, tubing in front with the little entrance porch softens the severity of the bulk of the house. And also you can see on the left-hand side the glass brick. This is a, a typical Corbusier kind of approach to architecture, okay? This is a little house which our office did for uh, Ann Christensen, I can't believe more than 50 years ago. It's a sort of takeoff of a Danish farmhouse, okay? And this is the house on uh, Ryan Street, which is called the Falwell House. I want you to look at this very closely because we're gonna make a connection to the next house. Uh, this is hard to classify uh, architecturally, but it's because it's both a combination of a sort of a Spanish house with, for instance, the double stairway and the, the almost sort of stage set projection of those arches from the bulk of the house. But notice the way that windows are set in very cleanly, white plaster. Uh, you can't see it in this slide, but it did have little urns sitting up on top of that uh, balcony, okay? And this is the McAfee House at uh, uh, 1801 C Street. Now, I w I've often heard the legend that the 
previous house which you saw was a house where the McAfee's moved after they sold this house. That turns out not to be the case, but this house was built for Mrs. McAfee's, ne or this house, the McAfee house, her nephew built the previous house. Let's go back to that. Now, this house on Ryan Street was built for the nephew of Mrs. McAfee, whose house you're gonna see next, okay? This is 1801 C Street. It dates from 1915, but it has a rather mysterious background. Uh, the Marquettes, who owned this lot, he was a prominent lawyer, and their original house was a big frame house which sat on the corner. And when the McAfee's decided to build this house, they moved that big house to the back of the lot, which evidently you could do, and it happens quite a lot in the near south neighborhood. Uh, and they put up this house in uh, 1915. Now, the uh, little book uh, doesn't uh, treat this house extensively, but it's, uh, McAfee was a prominent Chicago interior designer. But his wife, Gertrude, who was from Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, it must have been a sophisticated family of some means because she was sent to the Art Student League in New York to study art. Uh, how she met McAfee, I don't know, but it makes a logical connection. He was a very prominent designer in Chicago in the 1890s. In fact, his, he's best known because he did a lot of work on the Great World's Fair of 1893 in Chicago. And the book says that he got the plans from the fair I don't think that uh, can be possible because uh, <clears throat> he might have seen at the fair, maybe in the German or Austrian pavilion, some modern interiors from the 1890s in there. But it seems unlikely that he would have gotten a, a set of plans. The architect of this house was Paul Highland, a Chicago architect. But this house is totally unlike any of his other houses. He also did the Frank Woods house at, on Sheridan Boulevard, which is a kind of Spanish colonial. Uh, and he did a couple of uh, office buildings in Lincoln, uh, we know. But this doesn't seem like any of his work. And I've talked to Ed Zimmer about this, so it's kind of a mystery. Now, the question is, well, would we, would we think of this as a modern house? Yes, I think so. And where does it come from? Well. There's some interesting clues, but we're not quite sure about all of these. Uh, what seems likely is that uh, because he was an interior designer, he might have been very aware of an Austrian architect named Adolf Loos. Now, Loos was peculiar because he, unlike a lot of his counterparts in Europe, when they graduated from architecture school, they'd usually make the grand tour, but in Europe, all through Europe, looking at historical styles. Not loose. He came to Chicago in 1893 to see the World's Fair specifically. And he was really impressed by the sort of energy and the engineering and the technological and the sort of pragmatic attitude of Americans. And he went, he, we know that he was in Chicago, made some contacts there, then worked in New York for a short time and went back to uh, Vienna in uh, 1893. And he began to practice and he became a very prominent architect worldwide. So his work, including interiors and, and exteriors of his buildings, would have been published in all the magazines. I think it's more likely uh, that the roots of this house go to Adolf Luce and why? Well, because um, McAfee, as a leading designer, would have been very well aware of Adolf Luce's work. The other thing is we were able to track down is that some of Luce's students, because of his contacts in Chicago, came back to Chicago to work there. Well, you get the period from 1893 to 1915, that gives a long time for McAfee to become acquainted with this. Uh, so this is very much like some of Luce's work. And if we can see, go to the next one. I want to show you this house, however, is an odd combination of things. This plaque which adorns the front of the house is not Luce, that's Louis Sullivan. 
uh, you can take that decoration, it's almost out of the copy books. It's very strange. So it's an eclectic house, okay? Now, this is an Adolf Loos house from 1910 in Austria, and it shows some of the same characteristics. White plaster, notice the windows with the two casement windows with the window above it, very sharply cut into the facade of the house. And this house was published widely around the world because it was so avant-garde and clean and modern. Okay. Then I, here's Lewis himself, and I'd like to show you the, uh, the section of the house because the house at 1801 C Street has these same characteristics. Lewis loved to work in sort of half levels. Well, at 1801 C Street, you come in at one level and go down to the living room, which is 17 feet high, or you go up to the dining room. And uh, it's a, a very multi-level house. And this is a section through one of Luce's houses uh, in Paris. And you see that same tendency to create those double height rooms. And this really sort of relates it to the uh, McAfee house, okay? Okay, well, uh, we've not been able to establish, but two eminent historians, Henry Russell Hitchcock and Rainer Banham, who visits to Lincoln years ago, were taken to the house, and they said, you know, it's unmistakably, the way you have that side entrance, the way it's positioned, the proportion, there's gotta be a connection, and we have this strange connection between uh, uh, Mr. McAfee. I think the dynamic between McAfee and Paul Highland, his architect, was probably mostly Mr. Uh, McAfee. Uh, th and there are legends about this house at 1801C. One of them was that Mr. McAfee used, there's a balcony over the living room that he used to throw great bolts of cloth over the, over the balcony. Well, uh, I didn't, believe it or not, I did not know Mr. McAfee, but <laughs> I did know Joe Winterhalder, who was a, uh, ran a decorating business in Lincoln, and he worked for Mr. McAfee when they uh, lived in that house. And uh, I mentioned this to Joe once, and he said, well, I mean, people make it into some kind of an incident. He said it was very practical. I mean, if you wanted to show a client some big pattern in a fabric, that was a good way to do it. We didn't think of it as being very theatrical. Well, uh, it's, a, it's one of Lincoln's really interesting houses, and what I find about both, the, uh, uh, both of those houses, which I talked about extensively, is the social history of the house becomes as interesting as its architectural history. Uh, you know, it's that goes back, whatever happened to Sally Caldwell? I often, what happened to all these people who lived in 1801 C Street, first the McAfee's, then uh, the Ridnor sisters lived there in the 20s and 30s, the other people lived there in the 40s and so forth. Well, I'd like to uh, end this it's interesting to see these various styles of architecture, but I think uh, one of the virtues of Lincoln is its neighborhoods, that collectively they make up a very pleasant environment. And I'd uh, just like to show you, some, run through these neighborhoods and show them to you. Here we go. This is Eastridge with the houses by my friend Sid Campbell. Okay. This is a little Laura Avenue, a little gem off of J Street. This is... Uh, uh, part of South Lincoln, South 31st Street. Woodshire with the landscaping by Ernst Hemringhaus. And even the later developments out at the, the lodge, uh, it shows the change of our demographics with all these townhouses for retired couples, okay? Pleasant neighborhoods all over, all over Lincoln. And I just, uh, in closing, I just want to read uh, to you from the introduction I did for the book and uh, uh, one that was published. If there is a continuity in Lincoln architecture, it is not to be found in style because that is very mixed and eclectic. It's rather in the consistent quality of neighborhood housing and pleasant if not exemplary quality of design. I'm delighted that the editors have chosen to illustrate some residential neighborhoods from the early German-Russian immigrant areas to the garden suburbs, for it's the overall quality of planning and design which establishes the character of a city, and the end gives us perhaps the best clue to inherent values and goals. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Yeah.